Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Every week, EWTN allows me to, uh, to enter into your homes to help uh, our guests share their journey of how following our Lord Jesus brought them into a fullness of the faith. And uh, it's a great privilege of ours to have Cliff Bajima with us. Uh, he's a former Christian Reformed pastor. So Cliff, right. welcome to The Journey Home. Thank you, Marcus. It's good to have you here. And uh, you were sharing before that uh, uh, the Lord has opened up so many doors for you now after coming into the church that so you have time to fish and hunt and do your <laughs> garden. I'm thinking, well, I wish I was there. Yeah. <laughs> Up right. in Michigan. Yeah, retirement is good. <laughs> well, and that's a great place How far place are for you it. from that? <laughs> oh, we'll see. <laughs> if ever. If ever. But, uh, you know, I grew up in Ohio, south of Michigan, and but my image always of Michigan was just what you've said. It's hunting and fishing. That mm -hmm. was my, yeah. my view of that wonderful state up north. So, uh, uh, but welcome to the journey home. And what I generally do, Cliff, is get out of the way as soon as I can and, and invite you to go way back and uh, help the audience understand your spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. Good. So how'd you begin? Were you, uh, were you brought up uh, Christian Reformed? Or? I was, yes. I grew up in um, Northwest Washington State in a little Dutch community, kind of like Holland, Michigan, okay. uh, Linden, Washington. And uh, there are four Christian Reformed churches there. And um, in just a, at that time, a city of 2,700 people. So it was very much dominated <laughs> by the Reformed uh, community. And uh, my parents were, were of that extraction. And I was raised in that faith, went to Christian Reformed uh, parochial schools and attended Calvin College later and then graduated from Calvin Seminary in Grand Rapids. So very much very uh, all the way through, yeah. Well, maybe uh, let's assume we've got a few Catholics watching this program <laughs> and really have no uh, understanding of any distinctions between how you would have been brought up in the Christian Reformed I mean, culture. It wasn't just the faith. You're talking about Christian reform culture right, right. compared to Catholic culture. Yeah. Well, um, I would say that um, we. It, the, one of the real similarities was that uh, you know when when I was a boy growing up, we would go to catechism class every week, yeah. and that would be similar to. Uh, kids in the Catholic Church, you know, going and studying the Baltimore Catechism and so on. Uh, but um, I think uh, where, where it was quite different is that uh, just the whole style of, of worship was, was very sermon-oriented. Uh, back then, it wasn't uncommon to, you know, to go to church and attend a worship service, as we called it, and then uh, sit and uh, around uh, tea or coffee or lunch and with relatives or friends, mostly relatives, and discuss the sermon, you know, Amen. good or bad, and rate it and judge it and so on. Uh, so much of, uh, of uh, the tradition I was brought up in, it wasn't about the liturgy, uh, it was about the the cognitive transmission of scripture yeah. uh, through preaching, and um, so that became a very important focus for me in my ministry as well. I, I placed a lot of emphasis on preaching. Uh, I was mentioning to one of your staff that I think through the 42 years that I was in the ministry, uh, I probably preached since we didn't have the lectionary. Right. I I would choose books of the Bible, and I would, say, preach through the book of Romans over a year's time, or I'd preach through through the Psalms, or I'd preach through Genesis or whatever, and probably over 42 years I covered <laughs> two-thirds of the books of the Bible. And uh, so a, a tremendous, and that's a wonderful thing that I inherited, a tremendous yeah. appreciation and a tremendous affection for uh, God's Word and uh, a love of the scriptures uh, that um, was always part of my, my upbringing. And then when I went through 
a Christian school. We had Reformed doctrine classes, which went back to the the writings of Louis Burkhoff and um, yep. so on. Uh, yeah, that was my and, systematic theology course that text that I had in oh, seminary. It was, with was it? Yeah, Burkhoff, Burkhoff systematic yeah, uh, theology. Yeah, right. And right. Um, so that's kind well, of. Let me. I'm just going to add to the to the non. Calvinist audience or the non-Protestant audience that that it was that systematic theology that forms the entire framework for Absolutely. then how you got in your pulpit every week and you were in there I'm assuming is like myself you, that the authority was in this book the Bible That's right, right. and the reason that I used to do the same is preach through Ephesians or preach through Mark as, as you're getting ready to do in your own Bible study to coming up is because by starting at the beginning and going to the end, you're not picking a, a favorite verse or uh, a verse you want right, to pound right, somebody right. with. You're just starting at the beginning and come what may. And it was the authority of that word absolutely was yeah. upon which you got into the pulpit. Right. Yeah. And um, you had to you had to deal with all the uncomfortable sections of scripture that way too. You couldn't just pick and yeah. choose. Or uh, topically jump around. Uh, I was mentioning to you earlier when we were talking um, before this interview that um, w in the Catholic Church, it's it's uh, preaching from, of course, the lectionary yeah. and the, the liturgical readings from the Old Testament and the epistles and the Gospels each Sunday, and and then the Psalms as responses. But I think that. Um, uh, what I've noticed, and I, it's it, it's okay, but I, I'm not sure it's a real strength. Um, in uh, some of the Catholic churches I've visited, is that the homily almost always is fairly topical, and it's almost always focused exclusively on the gospel passage, yeah. and the epistles are ignored. The Old Testament largely is just mentioned. Um, now this isn't always true, and I'm sure there are churches where, where it's more faithfully uh, preached. But um, uh, uh, and I've heard some wonderful homilies in the Catholic Church, but I I can't say that I would think that the preaching is across the board as strong as what I was accustomed to hearing as I grew up. Well, again, in, in the, that tradition, that great Calvinist tradition, it's yeah. when we think of. If we were to try and name names, recognizable names of Calvinist leaders over the last 300, they were always preachers. Yeah. You know, like, uh, there was, uh, it was the Scottish Presbyterian, first name was Peter, who was the, um, the chaplain to the Senate. There, oh, oh, you know, yeah. what but, was his name again? I can't, I can't remember. I can't either. <laughs> but he was a preacher. That's yes, what he was right. known for. This yeah. great pre movie about him. You right. know, the man yeah. called Peter. I think was his name. You know, but preachers about right. preaching the word, and you would come for that, and because it carried the authority not of that person, but because he rested it on the authority of this book. And yeah. another thing that I would say is distinctive to that. And correct me if I'm wrong. To that kind of upbringing, a Calvinist upbringing is this idea that where Luther was more, well, if, if it doesn't say you can't do it, you, you kind of can. Whereas in the Calvinist world, if it doesn't say you can, you can't. Yes, right. A yeah. very strict understanding of the Word yes, of God. Yes, yeah. A lot more, uh, uh, shall I say, a kind of almost a tendency to a kind of legalism and a casuistry that was uh, very, very strict. I mean, we couldn't, I mean, I didn't go to a theater until I was probably um, junior in high school, yeah. you know, in the 19, late 1950s. Um, and <coughs> uh, so we didn't, uh, you know, and, and dancing, there were never, you couldn't dance, you couldn't play cards except Rook, <laughs> call that Christian Reformed <laughs> Rook. <laughs> and uh, we were permitted to play that, but I mean, it was very, very strict. And you, you know, the Sabbath laws, you never went out to eat, you did not, on, on Sunday, you didn't. You didn't. Uh, uh, there were friends of mine who's who's they couldn't even go out and to and play catch or play ball or, or go swimming or anything like that. It was uh, 
this was God's holy day and it was very, very strict. That isn't that way at all today. Right. But that's how I was brought up. Yeah. And um, so, and it wasn't all bad. It was, you know, I, I look back on that and I smile, but on the other hand, I think that, uh, you know, it came out of a deep piety of yeah. my family and of my parents and of those people who taught us. And it wasn't just uh, a strict legalism. I think it was a deep piety. And they really had a profound respect for the commandments and so on. The commandments are a big thing within yeah. the right. Reformed faith, the preaching of the commandments as part of preaching the catechism, mm -hmm. the Heidelberg Catechism and so on. Right. So. Well, there would be an example where Presbyterians and Lutherans and, and Calvinists kind of overstepped that Heidelberg Catechism for right, a unified right. faith. The that they would, they would, yeah. Westminster, that was really the, the foundation for my own idea, the, right. my own f preaching. Um, another thing that I think about when I think about that fairly strict Calvinist background is predestination. Right. Was that a part of the, uh, an idea as you look to other people? Predestination was one of the major uh, obstacles for me in remaining Calvinist. Um, and I, when I went through uh, high school already uh, and studied Louis Burkhoff, I, I started to have some, some reservations that I didn't voice. When I got into a seminary at Calvin, um, I used to write papers and I began to question um, quite seriously the Canons of Dort especially. Hmm. The Canons of Dort are one of the three uh, confessions uh, that you subscribe to when you become an office bearer within the Christian Reformed Church, along with the Heidelberg Catechism and the Belgic Confession. Right. Well, the canons, uh, uh, you know, you probably know this, but they are kind of uh, structured uh, in a kind of rationalistic uh, uh, progression from uh, total depravity to unconditional election, limited atonement irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints. It's called TULIP, Tulip. which fits with a Dutch background as well, of course. <laughs> but um, I just uh, began to have lots of questions about it. Um, and uh, all of their theology is driven by that structure yeah. and, and by that framework, um, which um, I came to have significant problems with. In fact, when I was ordained, Marcus, I. I was ordained, I was examined by Classis Rocky Mountain uh, because I had been called to a church in Colorado Springs, my first parish, my first church. And before I could begin the ministry there, I had to be examined uh, by um, uh, the uh, classes, as it was mm -hmm. called, uh, which consisted of pastors and elders, two elders and a pastor from all of the churches in that region. And uh, I was examined all day long, and the examination finally ended at about 1 a.m. the following day <laughs> because I got to the point where I honestly stated to them that I had these reservations and questions with regard to the canons of Dort. And um, the, uh, I had issues with, uh, you know, the, the, their understanding of total depravity, um, their understanding of election as a kind of, um, shall I say, a selection that involved a rejection, yeah. a selection of some before the foundation of the world that involved a rejection of the reprobate, um, and that, um, and then the the whole idea of that the, the atonement of Jesus was limited, um, and um, I I questioned that, and then the irresistibility of grace, that it couldn't be resisted, that there was no functioning of the human will anymore, it was completely dead. And, um, and then the perseverance of the saints, that once saved, always saved. Uh, all of those, all of those yeah. points became problematic for me, and so I, uh, I expressed some of this to the classes. Honestly, I thought, well, if I'm not going to be allowed into the ministry, uh, at least, I, I, or if I'm going to go in, I at least have to go in with integrity. And so um, I expressed some of these things, knowing that probably two thirds to three quarters of the men sitting there, especially the pastors, agreed with the same reservations. Uh, even though they have to sign a formula of subscription, 
saying that they fully agree with these confessions. And uh, so I said, well, you know, I don't know that I could completely say that. And uh, so, well, then they went into executive session and all this debate about what to do with this man. And uh, finally, because there probably were so many of them who had, uh, you know, basically watered down their Calvinism for so long yeah. and were no longer really believing totally in all of those propositions and certainly weren't preaching them anymore, uh, that they, uh, they finally said, well, Cliff, they said, uh, could you state that you don't have reservations or differences, but you could just have some questions remaining about some of these things? Uh, I said, yeah, I could do that. And they said, well, secondly, can you pledge that you will not publicly undermine hmm. those confessions from the pulpit in your ministry? And I said, I believe I can do that. I said, I will want to expositorily preach, uh, and it was, this is something you may want to explore, but I, going through Romans uh, in I was gonna say, how could several you? times, I, yeah. uh, and teaching Romans to discipleship groups that I've always been a huge believer in discipleship of young men and women that I get around me for a couple of years and I usually, one of the books I always do with them is Romans. And yeah. Romans, interestingly enough, brought me in the very opposite direction than it did Luther <laughs> or Wesley. And so I became, I mean, the, 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 probably the book that most influential in bringing me to Rome was Romans. And so at any rate, I had to say, look, I'm going to preach the texts as honestly as I can, but I will not point out where what I'm preaching may not be in agreement with this canons, and I won't publicly undermine. And they said, well, we will accept that. So I was ordained, mm -hmm. but I never, it didn't get better, you know, and I, through the years of preaching and teaching and then reading, uh, I began to discover so many of the people that I was, was gravitating to were, were Catholic thinkers. And, uh, and so um, I began to um, uh, move away. And so when we finally decided to convert to the Catholic faith, that was one of the, shall I say, the issues that we, okay. uh, that we could finally say openly and without embarrassment that I, I don't agree don't. with that perspective. When you look back on on that phenomenon within Calvinism, within whether it's Presbyterianism or Scottish Calvinism, right? The presumption behind those convictions is Scripture alone. But it seems to me, as I look back on my own Calvinism, that really it was it was a more important conviction of the philosophy of the sovereignty of God over everything else. It was right. a commitment to hold true this idea about God, his sovereignty, and to not do anything that would take away from his sovereignty, which therefore led to TULIP. Yes. You're, you're absolutely right, and that's one of the, shall I say, the, uh, uh, the inconsistencies of the church is that uh, on the one hand, they hold to uh, sola scriptura, scripture alone, and, and, and say we have to derive our doctrines and our understandings, our dogma from scripture. And yet, I think that what, happens in, what happened in the Canons of Dort is that uh, the, uh, those that spent all that time drawing up those canons and debating them came out of a kind of 17th century rationalism that, uh, that uh, absolutized uh, everything from the perspective of God from before the foundation of the world, issuing divine decrees, yeah. and then working them all out. And everything flows logically and rationally in a sort of ordo salutis, an order of salvation that is all consistent in a rational way, if you begin with that as your premise. 
And you, uh, the Arminians, on the other hand, Jacob Arminius, they kind of, uh, uh, shall I say, uh, absolutized uh, the uh, the uh, the autonomy of of the human being and of yeah. human choice, whereas. When Calvinism was more almost a, a divine, uh, 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 shall I say, uh, perspective that everything had to be looked at from the perspective of what God was doing, and uh, we almost become as human beings, uh, well, not 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 totally, but in a sense, like puppets, yeah. Um, yeah. you know that that respond to the preordained and predestined and foreknown will of God. And how can it be otherwise then? Yeah, yeah. I remember a woman in, in one of my Presbyterian churches, almost to her dying day, being absolutely convinced she was one of the, the damned. Yeah. And there wasn't a thing she could do about it because yeah. before the beginning of time, God for some reason had declared her one of the damned. Yeah. Yeah. And there was nothing to do to convince her otherwise because she was so absorbed in that mindset. Right, right. And um, I know one of, the, one of the writers that shaped my mind so profoundly uh, uh, in my thinking about some of these issues was uh, C.S. Lewis. Yeah. And um, the, uh, the, the way he deals with the issue of the will of God, um, shall I say, intersecting with the will of man and the mystery that he allows to stand at that point of intersection, yeah. that he can, he can dialectically, he can talk about uh, retrospectively as he looks back upon his conversion uh, in um, Surprised by Joy and some of his other writings, he, he says, you know, I didn't God choose I didn't pursue God any more than the mouse pursues the cat. You know, I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, God pursued me. Sure, he was long before and with my soul. But he's speaking retrospectively in the same way that Paul, like say in Ephesians chapter one, is retrospecting with the Ephesian Christians who have come out of their Jewish or pagan backgrounds. And they are now, um, sort of uh, wondering, well, how did we get here? Here we are now in this body of Christ in this wonderful experience of Christianity, and we are living in the grace of God. We are the forgiven people of God. What happened to us? <laughs> and Paul says, well, look back. He says, do you know that way back before the foundation of the world, God was in Christ calling you? Hmm that he chose you in Christ. There's that in Christo, always in Christ. So that the perspective of Paul is really, um, you know, uh, if you really want to trace the, the, the origin of your, and the, the very beginning of your salvation, your journey into faith, you have to go way back to when God chose his own son and you were somehow mysteriously incorporated into that election of the elect one, the beloved of God, the true beloved, which is Christ. And you now can look back on that and say, praise the Lord, thank God, you know, uh, that uh, like that, that, that old, that hymn that's in the uh, uh, Presbyterian hymnal, the Dutch hymnal, the Christian reform, the Psalter hymnal, I sought the Lord and afterward I knew, afterward I knew, looking back, he moved my soul to seek him seeking me. Yeah. And yet when C.S. Lewis talks about, prospectively, when he talks about what do you say to someone or what was said to me when I wondered how do you become a Christian? How do you get into that body of Christ? How do you become forgiven? Then it's all based upon the mandates of repentance, yep. confession, prayer, uh, the submission of faith, uh, obedient faith, and so on. And uh, then it's something you have to do. And so uh, somebody was telling me one time years ago, and I've used this a lot in preaching, that if we were to imagine that there's an archway here between you and I, and let's say that you are not a believer and that I am, and, um, and you say to me, uh, Paul, I'm, let's say I'm Paul, and you say to me, Paul, how do I become a Christian? 
how do I get into the body of Christ? How do I become forgiven? And, you, and I say to you, well, you're looking this direction forward, and I'm looking backward. And what do you see written on your side of the archway? And you said, well, I see written there, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I say, okay, then do it. And uh, so you get on your knees and you crawl your way through the archway and, and, you, uh, <laughs> and you come crying and weeping and, and you say to me, wow, this is amazing. Here you are now in the first chapter of Ephesians. How did I get here? And Paul says, do you turn around, Marcus? What do you see on this side of the archway? You see, tis not that I chose, that you chose me, but that I chose you and called you to be my son in love. <laughs> That's what Ephesians 1 is all about. Yeah. But yeah. what he, Paul doesn't do in Ephesians 1 is try to resolve the mystery of how those, how the sovereignty of God and the sovereignty of man can somehow intersect it's like Chesterton said, um, and I, he was another one of those that really influenced me to become a Catholic. In his book, Orthodoxy, he said, good theology doesn't solve all the mysteries. It locates them in the right places. <laughs> and I just, you know, and that is why Lewis so appealed to me, because he could speak dialectically in that way about the the sovereignty of man prospectively and the sovereignty of God's understood and viewed doxologically or retrospectively looking back and uh, give all the praise and the glory to God and say it was God's grace, it was by faith and all that, but, uh, but he always remembered where he was standing and which way he was looking when he said what he said in his books. You know, the good illustration of that, uh, Cliff, is after Peter preaches his first sermon after the resurrection, the ascension, Pentecost, he preaches the sermon and the guys come up and say, hey, what do we do now? That's just like at the arch. Yeah. Peter didn't say, well, the fact that you've come is proof that from the beginning of the world, God had chosen you to come. Exactly. He doesn't say that. No. What does right. he say? Repent and be baptized and receive yeah. the Holy Spirit. Yes, right, right. Yeah. So there's that, the beautiful mystery yeah. of that. And I understand also your tension because when I was in seminary studying Calvinism, my theology paper was on if God so predestined all things from the beginning of time, why pray? Yeah. I mean, there's the issue. Yeah, right. Yeah, why pray? And um, I, uh, and if, if, if grace is irresistible, what, what does my decision or my commitment my conversion, where is my part in that other than is almost a kind of rubber stamp or a kind of almost a necessary response to what God has ordained? And uh, is there any possible way it could happen any other way? Um, I mean, even to the extent of if you really believed in TULIP, yeah. then it takes away all the wind out of your sails to even want to preach. I mean, yeah. why are you getting up their expository sermons if these people are either there because of God's grace or not, it has nothing to do with their choice. Yeah. We're going to take a break now, Cliff. Oh, we'll come my, back after okay. that. All right. All right. Good. Because um, uh, you've talked about one thing that opened your heart to the church. When we get back, we'll, we'll look at a couple other threads. Sure, sure. Right. That'd be great. All yeah. right. Back. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host, and our guest tonight is Cliff Bajima, former Christian 
Reformed pastor, we're having a good time bantering on, on, <laughs> on our common background with Calvinism. And I remember having the same struggles with you. So that was one of the, the, the issue of predestination. Well, what else? You, you served as a pastor for a, a, a great many years. 42 years, yes, right, until I retired in 2003. All right. My last pastorate was uh, 15 and a half years uh, at what was called Geneva Campus Church. Um, at uh, the University of Wisconsin in Madison, okay. and I had a congregation largely of, of uh, professors and grad students and undergrads and professional people who were gravitating in, in and around the university there. And uh, so, I was yeah, say, it's uh, one thing to have a problem with the canons of Dort that wouldn't necessarily make you a Catholic. No, though. I no, mean, it might have made you a Methodist, but right, uh, right yeah, well. Yeah, there were so many other issues, and I wouldn't want to say that that was, if that were the only issue, I'm not sure that I would be Catholic today, although it certainly played a part in it. Um, but I, I think that, you know, when I, when I thought about it, when I made my testimony after I was confirmed, I had to use the analogy of hunger that I was hungry. For, there were a lot of deep-seated hungers in me that were unsatisfied mm. after all these years in ministry. And one of them was a profound hunger for the Christ. Not the Christ of concepts and cliches or the Christ understood through sermons or seminary scholars, but the Christ that I could touch and taste. Mm. The Christ that I could, um, that I could uh, visualize, and the Christ that I could encounter uh, in the Eucharist um, and in the liturgy, um, I see the. Well, I came to appreciate so much the liturgy in the Catholic Church, and that it is the same in all the churches wherever you go. <laughs> you know that was a frustration in the Protestant faith is that. After I retired, I had a chance to visit all these different churches, and you never knew what in the world you were going to get, you know. Um, so at any did you rate, ever, um, did you ever do pulpit supply? Oh yes, because that would that be the frustrating yeah, thing. Yeah, all yeah, of a sudden, what are yeah. you going to do? <laughs> but at any rate, I, I, you know, came to see that the liturgy is, is a, uh, it's a drama, a reenactment of of the whole drama of redemption. Uh, and that it culminates, it begins with the knowledge of sin and the confession and uh, so on, and then ends with the victory of the death and the resurrection of Christ celebrated in the Eucharist. And you take that journey in every uh, Mass. And, uh, and so if the, the homily is weak, which it may sometimes be, it isn't always, sometimes it's wonderful, but I didn't have to go home and, and say, well, that worship was a waste of time because I didn't get a good sermon today, <laughs> which is the way it always was in yeah. previous experiences of worship. But the liturgy is always sufficient to rescue me from the inadequacies and the foibles of whatever particular presider uh, priest is leading in worship. And so, and especially going home and feeling that I was fed that I was infused with the, with the living Christ and with His Spirit. That, to me, has become so precious. And to my wife as well, uh, when we first started to, after we were confirmed, we first started taking um, uh, the Eucharist. Um, my wife, her name, her name is Faith, she would, she would literally sit there in tears and just weep in church because um, she was so used to just, well, hearing me preach all the time, and she thinks I'm the best preacher in the world. It wasn't that. <laughs> but she was also aware that I was always subject to criticism or evaluation and scrutiny and all the rest, yeah. and so always defensive for me and that kind of thing. She can now just relax, and she can just receive and be infused and just be touched, and, and she can taste and embrace the Christ in this, in this wonderful liturgy. So that was a hunger. I had a hunger for the rest of the story, or the whole story, shall mm -hmm. I put it that way. The, so much of the, the history of the church that I was exposed to 
was that which began in the 16th century with the Reformation. Yeah. You know, it was, it was as though the rest of the history was touched on briefly, but, um, and, uh, but I, wanted, I wanted to know more, and so part of my journey into Catholicism was, was reading um, the Orthodox Church by Callistus Ware and some of the Orthodox theologians. Uh, Peter Gilquist was, oh, a, right. was an influence. Um, and um, I, uh, I came to appreciate that whole Eastern side of the faith, and that got me into reading like the Philokalia, the five-volume oh, series of collection of excellent. the writings of yes. all of the, the church fathers from the Eastern side of the church. Right. And uh, I began to realize, holy cow, I did, I haven't, you know, I've been, I've had such a limited perspective, a yeah. Western perspective, and not just Western, but Protestant Western, 16th century and on. And uh, so I wanted the whole story. And when you get the whole story, um, it changes your perspective on a whole lot of things. I was going to say, you're talking about the Philokalia uh, as well as Catholic spirituality. Well, within a strict tulip Calvinism, there's no real call for that kind of growing in intimacy with Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. A call for holiness, a call for changing, continual conversion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I think partially that, that, that comes out of um, this separation of justification from sanctification, um, which was almost total with Luther. With Calvin, they were still connected some. But again, as I studied yep. the book of Romans, and you go through those first uh, um, uh, five chapters of Romans, you're dealing with the whole doctrine of justification by grace through faith. But then you come to chapter six, and you, uh, at that point, uh, both Luther and Calvin would say, you're now, you're now into the gratitude portion of your Christian experience. You're now into your response portion. And Luther would say, your works and the good things and this acquisition of holiness and so on is not part of your salvation. Yeah. Whereas in the Catholic faith, um, salvation is understood far more dynamically as, as uh, uh, where justification or being forgiven and declared righteous by God and sanctification being renewed, being participants in the resurrection as well as in the crucifixion of Jesus. That is, uh, is all part of a progressive salvation and conversion. Mm -hmm. Whereas in, in Calvinism, for example, like in the Heidelberg Catechism, you have the division of the Catechism into sin, salvation, and service. Okay? So, um, or guilt, grace, and gratitude. Well, the grace part goes up through, you know, the, the fifth chapter of Romans, and then you get into the gratitude and the service part in the rest. And, uh, and so your your good works and your holiness, your pursuit of holiness is encouraged, but it isn't something that is relative to whether you are saved or remain saved. Um, whereas in the Catholic faith, that's not true at all. Right. You have to, I mean, this pursuit of holiness um, is, is part of the process of salvation. Yeah, and that, and, that one verse in Hebrews where it says to to seek the peace and holiness apart which you will never see yes. the kingdom of right, heaven. Right, right, right. I mean, that's a call to yeah. seek that. I was thinking about your expository years. Uh, I assume you preached through the Gospel of John. Oh, yes, several times. So there's a couple places in that Gospel, John 6 being one, yes, I'm wondering how you handled that, but also yeah. John 15 where it says you've got to abide. Yes. You know, dealing with the, 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 the constant abiding in a Calvinist theology right. would have been tough. Right, right, yeah. Another, uh, you know, hunger that I had uh, that wasn't satisfied within my Protestant framework uh, until I began to really uh, get into the Catholic tradition of prayer. Uh, and I spent uh, oh, several years studying the whole 
uh, discipline of Lexia Divina and actually wrote a two-volume work on it and mm -hmm. um, taught that to a whole group of uh, students at the University of Wisconsin over a period of two and a half years um, where you learn to pray the scriptures and um, go through the process of, of, of reading and meditation and prayer and contemplation and that whole uh, but the but the prayer becomes more of a dialogue, having listened to God. Like for example, Chrysostom mm -hmm. uh, mentions in his in his um, apostolic injunctions that that every Christian in the first couple centuries was was required and expected to memorize and to sing and to pray every day Psalm sixty three. Well, I didn't know this, and I thought, what is that? And so I looked into it, and I, and, uh, and I began to see what what a wonderful thing that was. That here's David in the wilderness of Judea, uh, Idumea, and he's in flight from Absalom, and he's been chased out of his kingdom. Absalom has turned the hearts of the people against uh, their king, and he's he's now uh, uh, in hiding, so to speak. He's lying on the desert floor. He's all alone. Doesn't have his doesn't have his palace, he doesn't have his temple, he doesn't have his wives, he doesn't have anything. He's alone and he's rather than doing what I was beginning to experience all the time in evangelical Christian circles was this constant petitionary prayer for God to intervene in circumstantial needs of people's lives and then laying it out to God, so and so is sick, so and so has cancer, so and so is out of a job, so and so is this and that. And, uh, and basically putting all these, this laundry list of needs before God and asking Him to rescue or heal or intervene in some way. Now, I, I don't think that's wrong to pray that way, right. but I didn't know anything about first really taking the word of reading it, meditating it on, chewing your cud with it, and taking it into your memory, especially the Psalms and some of the more precious passages of the New Testament, and really taking them so that as you repeat them, as you mutter them, the word meditation means to mutter repeatedly. As you do that, and you, you repeat God's words after Him, and as you do that, the Holy Spirit begins to produce an alchemy of response, and you begin to feel that Spirit speaking to you, and responding to you, and then the prayer starts to become a dialogue. And it's in that context that you can bring your needs before God. Like, like Jesus said in John 15, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. But the key is that his words have to abide in you. Or as Paul put it in Ephesians 6, pray at all times. He said, um, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, in the spiritual battle. And then the very next phrase is, pray at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. So if the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, and I'm supposed to pray in the Spirit at all times in all situations, that must mean that I should be praying the Word of God. Well. And that my prayer has got to be shaped and guided by that. And that whole tradition of prayer came out of the liturgical church, out of both the Eastern Orthodox and the Catholic tradition, out of the, out of the devotional writings of the saints that have so shaped my life. And uh, so that was another hunger yeah. that was only satisfied there. Well, there's an example of where ha us having not just a, the accessibility to Bibles, but Bibles upon Bibles upon Bibles has, it's, it's good on the one hand, but it's negative on the other because we don't get it up here. That's right. We leave it there. Right, exactly. It stays on the shelf or even we, or we emphasize, uh, I know in my, my background, we emphasize the discipline of study. So it was always an intellectual process, yeah. but we didn't emphasize the discipline of meditation or contemplation. And so, uh, the idea of taking it into you and memorizing it, uh, so that, for example, like when David was on that floor of the desert, he said, oh, oh God, you are my God, I seek you. 
My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and a weary land where there is no water. So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, and just imagine him looking up at the heavens, beholding your power and your glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. I'll bless you as long as I live. I'll lift up my hands and call on your name. My soul is feasted with marrow and fat, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips when I think of you upon my bed, desert floor, and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Now you notice that there's not one single petition there. <laughs> not one description of his circumstantial mess that he's in. Not one frantic plea that God would intervene, give him his kingdom back, take care of Absalom and all the rest. It's a seeking of God yeah. and a rejoicing in God. Little wonder that the early Christians were expected to pray that every day. I have come to do that now <laughs> and many, many other scriptures. Uh, but that was, what you just did was a great example. I think it was St. Augustine that was talking about why pray the Psalms? Well, now we live in a world where people want to emphasize the spontaneous, free expression of the faith, whereas Augustine says, no, 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 y you learn how to pray. Well, you know, in, when in, you memorize and pray the Psalms. In Acts 2, 42, right after Pentecost, when the early church gathered together uh, daily for worship in their homes and in the temple, it's it, the writer Luke reports to us, and day by day uh, they devoted themselves to four things, to the apostles' teaching, the, the didache, to the uh, fellowship, koinonia, to the breaking of bread, which is the early expression of the Eucharist or the yeah. agape feast, and to, in the Greek, tais proselkais, plural, with a definite article, to the prayers, not to prayer, singular. In other words, it wasn't just this spontaneous, now we're filled with the Holy Spirit, now everybody just erupt in prayer. No, they devoted themselves to the prayers. Well, what were they? Well, they had to be the prayers of the Psalms, the prayers yeah. of the apostles, the prayers of Jesus, uh, and so on. And, and they had those and they, you know, and when, when the whole monastic movement began, like with John Cassian and so on, who became so frustrated with the reforms of Constantine and many of the, uh, the younger priests were escaping from Rome and he went down to the Desert Fathers in, in Egypt and, and spent time with, um, with some of these Desert Fathers and uh, John Cassian. Um, you know, uh, he, he, and this led into the whole uh, monastic movement and, and Benedict of Nursia and his order and so on. Well, what did they do? Well, they would gather together as communities of faith and they would collect their collective memories of Scripture. And when they got a manuscript in their hands back then, if you had, say, a portion of Isaiah or you had a portion of the Gospel of John or whatever, you would, you would devour it. Mm. You would literally consume it and you would memorize it as quickly as you could because you might not have that manuscript very long. So then when they would come together in the divine order, they would share their collective memories and then they would pray. <laughs> That's Lexio Divina. That is prayer. And again, this was part of the rich, rich tradition of the church that, that brought me gradually into the Catholic faith. We've got about seven minutes. Cliff, oh. I want to make sure you have uh, the opportunity to give the, cover all the bases uh, oh. that opened your heart to the church. Well, I, um, I think that, you know, we, we mentioned earlier about the, uh, the, 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 how precious the scripture is to me, but I was also very hungry for the, uh, the rest of the story. Yeah. And the rest of the story is the, uh, the role of the church in interpreting the scriptures and passing on not just the scriptures, but also the oral tradition of teaching that came originally from Jesus and then through the apostles and through the bishops all the way down to the present day. And so I feel like, um, you know, uh, 
without that that sacred tradition and without that see i've i've changed my phrase it's um uh uh from Scripture only to Word of God only, and the Word of God understood not just as that which is written, but that which has been orally transmitted in yeah. the sacred tradition of the Church, and has been infallibly transmitted through the uh, extraordinary magisterium of the Church, primarily with the the uh, the, ecumen the councils of the Church ecumenically meeting through the years. Which isn't so, just an intellectual, but no. it's all. It's the liturgy. And this and prevents you from this prevents you from this sort of um, well. What are there thirty thousand plus yeah. Protestant denominations today? Because everybody's their own interpreter. Yeah. Scripture only. Well, yes, but somebody still has to interpret it. And I was so hungry. I, I, there were so many reforms and changes going on in the Protestant world, particularly ethically and morally. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this was starting to come in my own denomination that I began to be hungry for somebody that could speak with some authority and say, this is what we stand for. Mm -hmm. And this is how the church has always understood it. And that, that, that had some authority that could co-opt me or co-opt <laughs> any theologian or any academic teacher in any seminary. And that's so comforting to me in the Catholic faith as well, because there are a lot of teachers in Catholic seminaries that are just as liberal, if not more, than some of those that I have become disgusted with in the Protestant faith. But, but they don't have the authority to change anything apart from the, uh, the working of the extraordinary magisterium of the church. And that, to me, has brought much peace and has settled my soul in a way that uh, uh, I can't even describe how profoundly grateful I am for that. Well, where was Mary in the journey? Was she a stumbling block for you? Mary was not a stumbling block, no. Uh, I would say that we were able, because I was very involved in the whole women's ordination issue in the Christian Reformed Church, and. Uh, all of my exegesis of the passages Old and New Testament didn't allow me to accept the ordination of women into the elders, uh, into the uh, headship positions of the church, elder or pastor in that case. Um, and I always had such a respect for Mary as the model woman and the ultimate woman because of her submission and her humility. Yeah. And so I, I, I you know, I, I compared her to the women's liberationists of my day and thought, well, this is the woman that I admire. <laughs> what I, I do find her to be a bit of a stumble, not her, but Catholic laity, sometimes how they relate to her. Uh, you know, I think that they're supposed to reverence her with a kind of ultimate reverence of a, a hyperdulia, uh, but not with latreia, not with worship. Yeah. And when I find announcements or I find liturgies, as I did just this past week with one of the um, uh, prayer services I went to where they talked about uh, um, praying uh, to the saints and praying to Mary and so on. And, and when they start referring to Mary being the agent of answering the prayer or the power of Mary or uh, and the prayer is, is, is all directed to her as though, here's my need, now Mary, you take care of it. Or w w even yeah. with a saint, that the saint is the agent of the, shall I say, the answer to the prayer, rather than, which I always hear from my own priest, thank God, and which in every bit of Catholic reading I've done is yeah. explained that, no, these are intercessors for you. Yeah. That is how they assist you in your life. And I have no problem with that, but I find it much abused. Well, it's a good example of making sure that our faith is guided by the, the teaching of the church exactly. and not the other way exactly. around. Not by lay superstitions or right. lay misunderstandings. Right, and uh, we're all in need of reading the catechism from time to time and make sure that we're, we're getting back online. Catechism, that was the ma one of the major, major uh, influences of bringing me into the Catholic Church. I, that 1992 and then translated in 94 yeah. catechism uh, was maybe, I consider it perhaps the most important book written in the last hundred yeah. years. Uh, and uh, I can't thank John Paul enough for commissioning it and Benedict enough 
for being having such a huge hand in the writing and the editing of it. Uh, those two popes uh, had a huge influence on me, and I praise God for them. Cliff, thank you for You're joining us welcome. on the journey home. Yeah, it's, it's really good and for you to share your own journey with us. And Lord's blessings as you continue to serve thank you. in your thank local you parish. Thank you so much, and thank you for all that you're doing and helping people continue well, that journey. Well, thank you. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I, I do pray that Cliff's journey, discovering the fullness of the faith, is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.